morning. Well, it's an, um, a pleasure to be here, and in fact, I think the, the word pleasure underserves the, the wonderful um, you know, feeling that I have about being here, and um, the other word that comes to mind is gratitude. I'm incredibly grateful for this chance, and also grateful for the work of uh, Artists in Contact, um, the work of Louisa and Marie, and, and imagining that this is possible, and then um, my family and friends for coming, <laughs> and uh, for all of you for coming. I know that um, getting up this early is not always the easiest thing. Uh, could I see the hands of people in the audience for whom getting up and being here at nine o'clock was some level of struggle? <laughs> Great. Well, uh, for those of you, I'll just want to refer back to the famous quote uh, from the 30s as part of existentialism, that life is a choice between boredom and suffering. <laughs> and I'm glad you didn't choose boredom. Um, so, uh, so welcome. And you know the other you know, thing I wanted. I'm only going to spend about 15 minutes or so orienting um, you folks to you know kind of my engagement with a topic that I, I imagine is of interest to all of you on, on the relationship between creative engagement and healing and health and healthy individuals and communities and so on. But I wanted to kind of frame it with a sense of urgency about the topic. Um, I think there's some really worrisome social trends. Uh, I don't have to. You know, kind of belabor them, everything from how, how we treat ourselves, how we treat each other, how we treat the environment. And you can take the perspective that maybe at any point in time people have said there worries some trends about how we treat ourselves, each other, and the environment, but for some reason I'm feeling a particular kind of urgency about it. And um, there's another wonderful quote by H.G. Wells. Now, a lot of us know H.G. Wells. He was wonderfully creative. He managed to terrify the entire state of New Jersey with uh, <laughs> his War of the Worlds uh, radio broadcast that got people thinking that. Uh, uh, there was an alien invasion. But he also has this great quote that history is a race between education and catastrophe. <laughs> and so the fact that all of you uh, suffer through an early morning wake up call to come here and educate yourselves and each other and ourselves, I think, um, is a remarkable thing. So let me launch into a couple of remarks. I'm going to try to do something that's very hard for both an academic and someone with a um, Semitic persuasion, which is to make a very long story short. But, uh, let's, see, let's see what we can do. So, you know, art and healing uh, and other mysteries. So it started with, with my kind of curiosity about this, why do human beings make art? And, you know, there's, this, uh, there's a film I haven't seen yet, the Werner Herzog film, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Has anyone seen it? And I hear remarkable things about it. It goes, 30, goes back 35,000 years to uh, a valley in France that has these cave drawings. And, uh, these are not from that valley. But I'm actually told that those drawings are remarkable in terms of their delicacy and their anticipation of painterly characteristics and so on. And um, well, and that's an amazing thing. But it, to me, actually, kind of thinking about it, it's kind of amazing. If you think, imagine what the world must have been like 35,000 years ago, kind of the light, the day in the life of, where your three main activities are, are getting enough food for sustenance avoiding predators, of which there were no small number back then, I'm sure, and then uh, procreating, right? That probably filled up the whole day, and, uh, and more so. And the idea that people would find the time to make marks on the wall. Together, you know, it's just an amazing uh, idea that they did that. And so there must have been something very important about that. Um, and then also something important about the fact that art seems to be everywhere. Everywhere we can find recorded history, we find some evidence of creative expression. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and at all ages, here's another uh, important tribal activity. You can see the, uh, the interesting similarity between the prior one and so on. And in fact, you know, the idea of circles, which we'll come back to in story circles, um, maybe you know, kind of an interesting interweaving of why this creative expression seems to be so persistent. So why do we do art? Why has it been around for so long? Well, it, one simple answer is I've been trying to push into this kind of set of questions is maybe just because it's fun, you know? And it certainly is fun. There is some playful element to it, but I'm gonna suggest that maybe there are a couple of other things going on. One thing is, uh, you know, if you seriously engage in creative expression, one thing, it's almost inevitable, is you become more aware of the world around you. And it's, you don't have to work too hard to think, does that give you a survival advantage? I mean, if you buy into the Darwin model of evolution at all, you know, maybe you become more aware, or you have awareness uh, genes, if you will, that get preserved. Maybe they're linked to a creative gene. Uh, 
maybe those people survive better and, uh, you know, and that gene gets passed on. The other thing that, that's very intriguing to me about creative engagement in my own experience is actually many times about solving a problem. Now, you don't always know what the problem is you're trying to solve, but you know, you put your creative energies, whether it's in music or dance or visual arts, uh, or even um, what a friend of mine calls the world's slowest performance art, gardening, and you're not even sure what you're really trying to solve as a problem, but you're trying to solve problems and you could believe that people have better problem solving skills, again, survive and pass those genes on. So maybe a big part of why art's everywhere and seems to be constitutive of the human experience is because it makes us more aware and allows us to solve problems better and address challenges. Now that's a good thing because the world's filled with challenges. <laughs> and maybe it's the art and the creative expression that we do that allows us uh, to manage those. So a lot of my um, interest in, in actually creating the Foundation for Art and Healing is to go um, explore some of the other things that might be going on. So we've talked a little bit about the sociologic, the anthropologic questions about art and why is it there and how much is there and so on. But we can also ask the question, is there something going on uh, in the neurobiology and the physiology of human beings for, that resonates? And um, I'm fairly certain there is. You know, I think the started off this morning saying more questions than answers. That's certainly true about the neurobiology of creativity. Um, can I see the hands of people who took a lot of neurobiology in college? Good, well then you recognize this slide. <laughs> well, I'll give you neurobiology 101, which are the three important parts of the, all right, so the mind might be everywhere, maybe it's in the cosmos, who knows, but I know where the brain is, you know, it's kind of in the skull. And uh, here's a kind of uh, playful cross section of the brain. There are really three important parts of the brain that kind of just want to, at a functional level, have some understanding. The neocortex, the limbic system, and the brain stem. So the neocortex is that kind of teal-colored area, and that's where a lot of rational analysis happens and other kinds of um, processing of sense and sensation. The, uh, the limbic system is where the processing is of emotion, fear, anger, and that connects through the brain stem to kind of manage the machinery of the body, which includes uh, you know, the release of adrenaline when you get excited and other kind of neuroactive uh, peptides that kind of course through the body and create real physiologic change. And I think all of us have had the experience of um, seeing a shocking sight or something and actually feeling a sinking uh, sensation in the stomach. That, that's actually news that this is all working for you, okay? Uh, and sometimes it works to, I think, the benefit of health and sometimes to the detriment of health. And many times um, we're not sure in advance, but it's in our hands. And so actually as we were getting the foundation started, one thing we wanted to do was bridge the world of the creative artists like you folks um, in, in the audience with what's going on in neurobiology, neurosciences. And there's been some remarkable work across that entire landscape, but probably nowhere is it more powerful than within cardiovascular disease, within heart disease where large population studies have shown that certain emotions actually can damage the heart and damage health. So-called cardiotoxic emotions, um, like anger, grief, uh, and so forth. And when you try to study, it's challenging to study, but we can, higher risk for a heart attack and so forth. And so we actually uh, had a roundtable convening of some of the nation's prominent cardiologists, as well as public health people and artists. We are quite fortunate to have Ed Hirsch, for instance, a wonderful poet who also is the head of the Guggenheim Foundation and some other remarkable artists, and we, we kind of discussed this. And uh, I think the art side is obvious about emotion and health. I think it's kind of intuitive to a lot of my guests and to all the folks in the room, but we were delighted that we were able to get some of the cardiologists, even though they were very left brain in their orientation to it, to, to actually say that if, if we can help, and I'll, I'll read Dr. Krumholz's quote, who runs the cardiology program at Yale. If we can demonstrate that emotion affects outcomes, as we know, right, they're cardiotoxic emotions, and art affects emotion, then a logical path to better outcomes would involve more attention to engaging people in artistic pursuits. So I think that fundamental left brain rational premise actually is growing in its uh, attention and traction uh, in the world in general. And I think we can actually propel that forward, but also benefit from them, even in some pragmatic ways, like trying to get some grant funding to do more of the projects for ourselves and our communities where we think creative engagement will improve health. But let's take it away from that kind of left brain for a while and take, take it back to everyday human experience. 
So who doesn't resonate with the human experience of uh, anticipation, disappointment, sense of betrayal, and so forth? I mean, this happens every day. Um, but I just want to point out that our experience of life isn't exactly that, okay, I didn't, you know, the ball was snatched away, I didn't kick it, but it's actually the emotional experience of what happened, which sets the stage for future uh, anticipations of how the world's going to be and how comfortable you may be doing something or not doing it. So really, our emotions do shape our sense of who we are, where we're going, what's possible. And if creative engagement can shape the emotions, then really, uh, we have our hands on some very powerful control levers about where our own lives can go. So does art heal? How does it heal? Uh, again, more questions than answers. But I'm going to suggest that there are, uh, at least in my view, um, three art and healing fundamentals. The first one is that if you do any kind of creative art, it puts you in the moment. I think that's uh, this is a statement, you can debate it, but I think it's actually very hard to either make art or receive the art of others without standing still in the moment experience of that art, and I think that's an important aspect of health. The second thing is art puts you in touch with yourself, and recognizing that there are centuries of debate about what the self is, or does the self exist, we'll leave that to the side for now and just say it puts you in touch with the self. Now, these first two principles, I think, have commonality with meditation, with prayer, with a lot of other things that probably have um, powerful health-enhancing effects, so I'm not saying just art, but the third thing that I think ties us all together and makes creative engagement um, remarkably different ties to the word create and the fact that you're bringing forth something that did not exist before. And in some mysterious way, I think that's very powerful. I think that's part of what engages those kids sitting around you know, with uh, crayons and glue to actually make something. Um, and I think there's something powerful and healing in the making of art within that moment um, and in being in touch with yourself. So that's, that's the opportunity we have. Now, of course, there are other ways life presents challenge, and maybe the best you can do is be creative in how you address those challenges. So as you go through, go through your day and hopefully navigate the stresses and so forth uh, of the day, you have creative opportunities uh, in front of you all the time. Um, so we don't really have a lot of time in this keynote, and I'm going to uh, wrap it up by talking a little bit about news from the front lines of art and healing and talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing uh, at the Foundation for Art and Healing. We'd love to have your engagement and your involvement in that. Let me um, perhaps uh, embarrass our executive director, Deborah Ovaliel, by asking her, oh, she's actively tweeting this, uh, <laughs> raise her hand. <laughs> and please uh, feel free to come up and speak with Deborah. Unfortunately, I'll be leaving uh, in a couple of hours, uh, so I can't be here all day, but uh, Deborah will be here much of the day. Um, and we have a website, please come to it. We're actually trying to do three things at the Foundation. One, and why I'm so delighted to be here, is just create awareness about the relationship between creativity and the healing opportunities. And again, we imagine healing very broadly. Is it healing myself, healing the person across, healing our neighborhood, healing the world, anything you want as far as we're concerned, because we think it's quite powerful in that. So we create awareness. The second thing is actually to very selectively engage in projects that can demonstrate art and healing principles in different communities of interest. So this actually is a little foreshadowing of work we're doing in the nation's sixth largest acute care health center Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx that has 17,000 employees. And we're actually doing some art, artistic creative engagement, not for patients directly, but for employees and staff who are among the most stressed, I mean, just right. see the picture, some of the most stressed out folks uh, in the workplace. But there are other workplaces equally stressful and we're gonna move these principles there. Um, and so, you know, we're actually out there doing, doing these kinds of engagements, see what works, how it works. And then the third leg of this stool is to try to do the research that evaluates what works, how much it works, and then how to propel it forward. Um, current programs uh, for the foundation you know, include those kinds of things, but uh, I won't go into detail there, except that we're open to any suggestions you folks might have. At the center of what we're really focusing on now are stories. Um, nice uh, kind of foreshadowing of what we'll be doing as story circles here in a few minutes. But we found that you know, the, um, the entry point for many people into art and healing actually is a story someone else is willing to share about their own experience with that. And so if you come to our website, you'll see a series of active narratives, but then we also collect those, and you can find them on our website, of people who have stories to share about how their own creative engagement uh, across art forms uh, of all types was very powerful. So uh, please feel free to share your story with us. And if you come to the website, it's very clear how you can go forward and do that. Um, how will we know?
know that we're as successful as we'd like to be? Well, probably um, there'll be lots of ways we can uh, uh, try to detect that. This is one almost uh, tongue-in-cheek answer I came up with. It was actually at the round table and someone asked, and Sylvia asked that very same question. Just, you know, I just came up with me, came up with, you know, you go to see the doctor and routinely they ask about diet, exercise, and so forth. How about an expectation that a doctor would ask you about your creative engagement? Not necessarily something you create, but maybe something you enjoy and just kind of validate and add credibility to the fact that it's a fundamental part of human biology and human health. And I, uh, I think we can get there. I think we're limited in how we get there only by our imagination. I think creativity and engaging with creativity is attractive, appealing, and engageable in all populations. We're starting to do a lot of work with older adults and, and their caregivers. It's an incredibly uh, challenging, often stressful situation. We're also very excited about um, doing some work with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, returning um, active duty troops from Iraq and other places who have uh, seen incredible and stressful, um, or had incredibly stressful experiences and are, st are still trying to process them. And we believe and we know, in fact, that uh, expressive writing and other kind of creative activity depressurizes some of what's behind uh, disa the disabling part of P PTSD. So opportunities, uh, I think, are endless. Um, closing slide, I think it will, it is a mystery now how all this works, but the fact that it does work is not a mystery. It does work. It works in our own lives, it'll work in our communities. And so I think it's up to us to keep moving it forward. So um, with moving it forward, I'm gonna invite our first case study panelist to come forward.